Hello, this is Shannon Jain with World Medical School and I welcome you to a lecture on gestation diabetes. I will discuss the pathophysiology, risk factors, how it presents, screening and diagnosis, treatment and management, and complications of gestation diabetes. Gestation diabetes is defined as new onset diabetes in a pregnant woman who never had diabetes. It usually develops in the third trimester of pregnancy and one to 3% of pregnant women develop gestation diabetes mellitus. The normal physiology is that the pancreas secretes insulin, which pushes the glucose from the bloodstream into the cells. While in gestation diabetes, the placenta in the third trimester secrete placental hormones like HPL or human placental lactogen, progesterone, prolactin, cortisol, placental growth hormone, TNF alpha, and leptin. These hormones inhibit the action of insulin, which causes the glucose to remain in the bloodstream. The risk factors for gestation diabetes include obesity, age greater than 25, ethnicity like Asian, African, Aboriginal, or Hispanic, family history, previous history, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and current use of glucocorticoid. Presentation of gestation diabetes. Gestation diabetes usually presents with no symptoms, but when it does, the symptoms are usually what you would see in regular diabetes like increased thirst, increased urination, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, bladder infections, yeast infections, and blurred vision. Screening and diagnosis. This point is extremely high yield. ACOG, or the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, recommend that all pregnant women be screened for gestation diabetes between 24 to 28 weeks gestation. And this is how you screen. You perform a glucose loading test in which you give 50 gram of glucose to the patient and check the blood sugar after one hour. If it is less than 140, it's normal and they don't have gestation diabetes mellitus. However, if it is greater than 140, you have to do an oral glucose tolerance test which is done by giving 100 gram of glucose and the blood sugar is measured after the first, second, and the third hour. If any two of the three values are out of a range, then they have gestation diabetes mellitus. The treatment involves lifestyle modification or a combination of lifestyle modification and medications. Under lifestyle modification, the patient should check her blood glucose level regularly. They should follow the American Diabetic Association diet, which involves limiting carbohydrates and including more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Diet and exercise of moderate intensity is also recommended. Increasing fiber in the diet has also been shown to help control blood glucose. Routine fetal ultrasound and non-stress test should be done to assess the fetal growth and development. Insulin is the main therapy along with glyburide. Some studies have shown metformin to be helpful as well. And after the delivery, insulin and ADA diet may be stopped. It is important to do regular blood sugar checks during labor and delivery. If glucose is found to be high, IV insulin can be given. Fetal heart monitoring should be done to monitor decelerations, and if late decelerations are seen, an emergency section can be done. Even after delivery, regular blood sugar checks should be done. Hypoglycemia is a big concern in the baby, so this should be monitored as well. Postpartum follow-up. Here are some facts. One third of women develop impaired glucose metabolism after delivery. 
5 to 10% develop type 2 diabetes immediately after delivery, and 15 to 50% develop type 2 diabetes in 5 to 10 years post delivery. Therefore, it is extremely important to screen for diabetes at 6 to 12 weeks postpartum. And how do you do that? By administering 75 gram glucose test and measuring glucose after two hours. If greater than 200, then it is diabetes mellitus and you manage the diabetes regularly. If between 140 to 199, that means impaired fasting glucose and you need to encourage weight loss and physical activity. Metformin may also be used in combination with lifestyle modification and a yearly follow-up as well. However, if less than 140, it means it's normal. But still, you have to encourage weight loss and physical activity and check up every three years. Complications of gestational diabetes mellitus. We can divide them into maternal and fetal. Maternal complications. Preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is increased blood pressure, proteinuria, and edema, especially if the patient has underlying kidney problems. Hypertension is due to insulin resistance. Polyhydraminose is when you have increased blood sugar in mom, which leads to increased blood sugar in the fetus, which leads to increased urine production by the fetus. Increased risk of infections like UTI and pyelonephritis because increased sugar in the blood provides for a good culture medium for the growth of E. coli. Fetal complications. Growth abnormalities like macrosomia, which is due to increased maternal glucose, which leads to increased insulin in the fetus, which leads to increased anabolism. Intrauterine growth restriction or IUGR, which is due to placental vascular insufficiency. Increased sugar also interferes with surfactant production in the lungs, therefore leading to fetal lung immaturity. Increased incidence of stillbirth is also seen. Preterm labor and prematurity are associated with poor glycemic control. Birth trauma like shoulder dystocia due to the baby being large. Hypoglycemia due to increased insulin secretion in neonates. Hyperbilirubinemia and jaundice is due to prematurity and polycythemia. Hypocalcemia due to functional hypoparathyroidism. And lastly, polycythemia because hyperglycemia stimulates fetal erythropoietin production.